Robert Caldini's Six Principles of Influence. Number one, reciprocity. In many situations, we pay back what we receive from others. When you offer something first, people will feel in a sense of indebtedness, which will make them more likely to comply with your subsequent request. This was a tactic actually used by Benjamin Franklin when he would often ask for a book from an opponent when a crucial vote was coming up and they would give him the book and then he would return it and he would create this sense of reciprocity so that they were at least a little bit more likely to vote with him. There are six factors that will make this principle more effective. Offer something first. So allow them to feel indebted to you and this doesn't have to come from anywhere other than a giving source because you never want to give something and then right away call for a favor. Number two, offer something exclusive. Allow them to feel special. Personalize the offer. So make sure they know it's from you and for them. You don't just want to offer them something random that will have no value in their life. For example, a book. You might offer a book to somebody and think that it's of immense value, but if they don't see it, value is subjective. So that always needs to be kept in the back of the, in the mind because that's all sales is. Sales is effectively convincing somebody that there is value within whatever it is that you are trying to sell. Small gifts win. So offer a small piece of candy or a small trinket that'll stay with them for a while, thus reminding them of you and your kindness. Number five, avoid over the top gifts. Unless you want to be put on some sort of watch list, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. And number six, tit for tat. Richard Dawkins found that of the three types of people, those that are the vampires, those that are the altruistic self-sacrificers, and those that are the grudgers, the grudgers do the best. The grudgers are those that start out nice and then reciprocate based on behavior, meaning that if you give and they're happy to continue to give, then you keep that behavior up until they refuse. Whereas the vampires and self-sacrificers both lack the balance needed and ultimately lose. So the vampire, they meet the grudger and right away they try to take, the grudger says, okay, I just move on. The self-sacrificer, they give and give and give, and eventually the vampire or the parasite finds a host. Match made in heaven, or not so much for the self-sacrificer. This was also highlighted in the book Give and Take, where they found that of the givers and the takers, the givers were both the biggest losers and the biggest winners, meaning that mindless giving, so being the self-sacrificer, is as stupid as mindless taking. Great quote. How can any man love the world if he cannot love himself? Take time to replenish. You do not owe anyone but yourself anything. So that's to say that nobody likes a burnt out hero. Those who give and then pull back based on the person's behavior, if they, let's say, don't reciprocate, those are the people. So they start out nice. And then depending on what the other person does, those are the people that are ultimately sheen winning. Commitment and consistency. We tend to stick with whatever we've already chosen. We are bombarded with hundreds of choices to make every single day. For convenience, we simply make a decision and then stick to it for all subsequent related choices. The way to earn customer loyalty using this principle is to make them commit to something, a statement, stand, identity. They will then feel an automatic compulsion to stick with it. Follow these three ways or I say these five ways to leverage this principle. Ask your customers to start from small actions. That way they'll have to stick with it. Encourage public commitments. They'll be less likely to back out. Peer pressure. Number three, reward your customers for investing time and effort in your brand. Number four, use the exclusivity principle for rewarding said customers. Whether it's exclusive swag like hats, t-shirts, or wristbands, wristbands being in the upper tier of round the clock cheap advertisement, or whether it's a black card for just a select few members, exclusivity works. Even something like a business roundtable comprised of the best clients to discuss the business's direction and offer their feedback goes a long way, not just in generating business ideas, but in rewarding your customer's commitment and consistency. Really, the longer that somebody can stay doing something, the more it becomes a habit, and you are what you repeatedly do. Thank you, Base Aristotle. Number five, ask yourself, what is the smallest trinket I could give, whether it be a sample of something or an actual item that would yield return in harnessing not only reciprocity, but also more of the customer's commitment. This can be something from a food sample, or this can be something sent to them in the mail, whatever it is. This can also be applied to your employees. If they've been with you for a while, you may want to throw a random gift. What's $50 if it incites $500 of productivity? Number three, social proof. 
we tend to have more trust in things that are popular or endorsed by people that we like. Hence why Kim K's perfume does so well. Not so sure how she gets it made, not so sure what goes into it, but, well, we all know why we buy it, or I should say people know why they buy it. So how to work it? Experts, approval from credible experts in the relevant field, not so much Kim K, but uh, celebrities. Yeah, there you go. So approval or endorsement from celebrities, paid or unpaid. Users, approval from current past users, so ratings, reviews, and testimonial. There was actually this book, it's called Absolute Value, that discussed this. In the past, companies would rely on experts. They would rely on celebrities. They would rely on advertising. Nowadays, that's not so effective because you can have the greatest ads in the world. Somebody types it up in Amazon, sees that it's one star. Not only are they not going to buy it, but you are you have just lost so much credibility. So times have changed. So you have to really engage with the users. Most companies nowadays will actually send people running blogs, running blogs, free products. And this is something that Ford CS actually harnessed in, I think it was a few years ago where they gave a few Ford CS says to people to just drive around for free for six months and document their experience. Wisdom of crowds, approval from large groups of other people. So it's tying into the Ford CS thing. If you see people driving around it, it seems like a good move from the company. It seems very generous. Thus, if it influences just 10, 20 more people, why the hell not? It costs them nothing. Peers, approval from friends and people that you know. The way that you want to work this social proof is if you have no social proof, the easiest way to gain it is to partner up or be seen in the presence, being around people with it. Halo effect shines through down onto you. If you want to make money, simply ask, where am I an expert? Because if you have an area of deep knowledge, you are just one person with social proof away in your niche from having something very dynamic, having a very dynamic partnership. So create a product with or for them and then split the profit. Let's say they have an email list, they have some sort of following online. Maybe they don't have a product. Find that person, leverage your expertise that way. Leverage their social proof that way. Number four, liking. We are more likely to comply with requests made by people we like. Hence why if Hitler said something that was true, people would be much less likely to believe it. In the same way, if somebody likable said something that was false, people are much more likely to believe it. So this can range from our closest friends to complete strangers that we're attracted to. This explains why we trust word of mouth recommendations from our peers, as well as stuff endorsed by our favorite singers. Follow these principles to make the, like, the liking principle work. Physical attractiveness. Make sure your website is well designed, function, functions well, and suits what you're selling. For your personal physical attractiveness, make sure to lift, maintain a decent body fat, keep proper posture, and read about strong body language, how to read it as well in other people. This is something, might be a small detail, could make a big difference. Similarity. Behave like a friend, not a brand. Show them that you can relate to and understand them. Effective sales comes down to how much you can flex your chameleon muscles. Compliments. Have a voice. Use social media platform, not just to broadcast, but hold intimate conversations and form relationships with your customers. The Gary Vanderchuk principle. Jab, 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 right hook. Create value, create value, create value. Ask for something back. Harness reciprocity that way. Contact and cooperation. Fight for the same cause as your customers. Nothing builds rapport and closeness like good old-fashioned teamwork. Conditioning and association. Associate your brand with the same values that you want to communicate and possess. Ask yourself, who likes me and how can I leverage my social proof and likeness to my benefit? Consecutively, ask yourself, why do they like you? And where did they meet you? In what areas do they like you most? So as to say, can you magnify this even further? Number two, who do you like and how can you create more value in their life? Is there something you can share with them? Number three, why do you like them? And what characteristics do you admire most within them? Can you spend more time with them? Number four, who do you like the least? And why do you dislike them? What characteristics do you dislike the most? And can you spend less time with them? Also ask yourself, where did you find them? Number five, authority. We follow people who look like they know what they're doing. This holds especially true in fields where we aren't experts. Most headlines utilize this principle by including phrases like scientists say, experts say, research shows. You can give off the air of authority if you pay attention to these factors. Titles, position of power, experience, clothes, superficial cues that signal authority, trappings, accessories, indirect cues that accompany authoritative roles. For example, real estate agent might buy a Lambo, nice car, even though the real value is knowledge, but they might buy a very nice car 
to show people, hey, look, I know what I'm doing. I make bank doing this. Maybe they don't even like the cars. Maybe they don't like the Lambo, but it's an investment for their service. This is why buying a product for somebody of high earth status or in a job where this product might be seen, it can be a great way to leverage it to provide social proof, but also to provide extra authority because clearly this person has some money, although nowadays you can rent, so you never know. But it is an effective tool if used the right way. So if you have little authority or social proof, but you want to harness these principles or see them in play, merely put yourself in a room where you are the authority. Remember, humans are not programmed for objective considerations of the entirety of 7 billion people. But more so, we are used to the way that we used to live, which was in about 100 people villages. So even if you know you're not close to an expert or authority or have tons of social proof in your field, this is irrelevant because much like a basic computer literate person will get called a god by someone they fix like something so minor that they're like how, how do you not get this so too will relative competence to your environment yield the benefits of robert c's prince of p of authority put yourself in rooms where you're the expert we're not programmed to think about people in this well uh there's roughly 1136 people ahead of you and i will go to them because even then you have to seek these people out you have to spend a lot of time investing People would just rather go to what's immediate to them, relative to them. Scarcity, number six. We are always drawn to things that are exclusive and hard to come by. We assume that things are difficult, that are difficult to obtain are usually better than those that are easily available. We link availability to quality. You can learn to trigger your customer's sense of urgency with these methods. Limited time, items in short supply that won't be available once it runs out. Limited time, items that are only available during a time period. Most online marketing websites harness this principle very well by having a timer saying, we're only doing this run for three days and then it counts down and it just gives an impulse. It's why McDonald's doesn't, uh, McDonald's also harnesses a little bit by not serving everything around the clock, even though they probably could, but scarcity. One of a kind special. Sometimes utilize one or two of the above techniques. Also for, form one-off events. So collaborations, anniversaries, something that utilizes a sense of surprise as well. Utilizing competitions. Our inclination is to want things more because other people also want them. So this is used in things like auctions or bids. And also remember law number 16 of the 48 laws of power. Use absence to increase respect and honor. Too much circulation makes the price go down. Federal Reserve, QE27 or whatever we're at, they know what's up. The more you are seen and heard from, the more common you will appear. If you are already established in a group, temporarily withdraw from it, and this will make you more talked about and even more admired. You must learn when to leave. Create value through scarcity. And if you guys want to find out more, I will link the website down below where I got all of these principles. It's a great website, has tons of great examples, referralcandy.com. Check it out. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Transcend mortal reality.